Now, art, goodness, it's entirely undervalued. I think that it's just getting worse and worse. This means that our, our critical thinking uh, is uh, really getting a blow from lack of exposure to good science and, and good science education. And our creative and expressive brain is also getting devastated by not being exposed to, to good art. I, I'm not sure which one is worse. <laughs> I, I, I think that that both are horrible and, and they create probably uh, a situation where where many people lose some of the, the finest fascination that human life can offer and that can also take them to, to a level of, of feeling part of a, of a vibrant community that, um, that, that, that really makes life worth living. It, it's, it, it's a shame. It's, it's really a shame. And I, I, I'm, I'm not sure whether I feel more sorry for the, the demise of science or for the demise of art. Both are, are really hit hard at the moment. Hello there, ladies, gentlemen, and as always, everyone in between, uh, this is Clifton Duncan. You found my podcast once again. Thank you so much for joining me for yet another fascinating conversation living at the nexus of art, entertainment, culture, and society. Friends, we are admonished over and over again to trust the science. Scientists and the practice of science have been deified and challenging what is accepted as scientific or medical consensus is often dismissed as quackery, even heresy. But... We're in an era of rising skepticism of all of our institutions, and how are we to determine what is true? And similarly, pertinent to this particular show, um, if we look at art as the pursuit of a different kind of truth, um, how are the two related, art and science? And um, how can we use both? You know, is one more important than the other? Can one be uh, prioritized over the other? Are they both important? Is the left and right brain dichotomy a false dichotomy? Is there a link between art and science? Well, uh, my guest today is uh, highly qualified, uh, and uh, I'm a bit daunted, but we'll see what happens. First, however, you're consuming this podcast, though, be it Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you prefer to scratch your CDP itch, make sure to leave a like, a comment, or a review if you're nasty. If you're watching on YouTube, I would deeply appreciate you if you subscribed. And as always, you can help this podcast and this community grow by sharing this show as much as possible. If you love it, share it with your friends. If you hate it, share it with your enemies. And and also, you can find me on Rumble, where I put exclusive content you can't find anywhere else, amazing conversations with amazing people like Viva Fry and uh, a mutual friend of myself and this guest, uh, Dr. Jay Bhattacharya, and way, way, way more. So be sure to sign up there and support me on Locals while you're at it. The links will be in the show notes. Lastly, I am a one-man operation. I prefer not to be a starving artist, so uh, a big, big thank you to my supporters on Locals, to my paid subscribers at my newsletter, The State of the Arts, and to the generous souls who donate via PayPal, Venmo, or Cash App. Thank you so much. It helps me keep pushing to bring you the conversations you want to see. Now, without further ado, if I were to read you uh, my guest's biography and achievements. Uh, we'd be here all day, but I'll try and summarize it as succinctly as I can. He is a Greek-American physician, scientist, writer, and professor at Stanford University, where he's the professor of uh, medicine, epidemiology, and population health and of statistics and biomedical data science. He's made significant contributions to evidence-based medicine, epidemiology, and clinical research. He's the author of one of the of the most accessed manuscript in the history of the public health of the public library of science and is one of the most cited scientists in history and uh, particularly pertinent to this show a little known fact he is a published poet and is also moonlighted as an opera librettist um, my friends this is dr john yanides and he he is a real person he actually exists he's not a ghost for those who are watching <laughs> there's something going on with his uh, with his uh uh, camera settings, but he's, it's not a bad 1970s music video. He he is here joining me via Zoom. It, it, there, there's something going on. Maybe 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 clean your lens. I don't know what's up, John. 
very pleased to to join you, Clifton. I I really don't know. Uh, I I think that uh, Zoom has made so much money during the last few years, and I've used it so extensively. But now it's uh, punishing us, apparently. <laughs> but uh, no, I'm I'm not a ghost. It seems that I appear like one. Uh, but uh, <laughs> let's see how how I can express myself to convince you that I'm real. Well, it it certainly is. Uh, it certainly is visually striking. I will say that much. Yes, indeed. <laughs> I, I was I was freaking out for a second. That you know, I thought that you were uh, that you were gone. Now, you know, I, I'll I'll start from the the beginning and your your background. Um, you because uh, I want to talk about uh, your work in science and challenging the establishment because you know there's a lot, especially over the past few years, um, we have. I, I've been very concerned, and and um, I, I presume you have as well. There, there's a lot of distrust in many of our institutions, and uh, you know, you were brought your your work, and you were brought to my attention in March of 2020, uh, when a friend of mine sent me your op-ed in the Wall Street Journal about the emerging pandemic and how maybe um, it 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 wasn't quite the Black Death that it was being made out to be. Um, and you've made a bit of a career and a name for yourself in challenging a lot of, um, I guess, established wisdom. But um, where, so I guess my first question for you is, um, you know, where is your, was there anything in particular in, in your background and upbringing that uh, made you say, separate yourself from, I guess, the, the status quo and the consensus and made you say, you know what, I'm going to, I have more questions about what's going on. It's it's hard to say whether it's an issue of of a drinking or or exposures, but uh, uh, I was exposed to science from a very early uh, age. My parents were both uh, physician scientists, and uh, uh, I, I had the ability to uh, to realize how difficult it was to do uh, science, to do scientific research. Uh, I think it's a very noble endeavor, but it takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of commitment. It is. Uh, uh, a joint effort of, of many people. You try to get it right, but it's very likely that you will get it wrong. Uh, you should not be disappointed if you fail repeatedly. And uh, uh, there's no final word. Uh, most of the time, you just uh, need to wait for better and better evidence. And at some point, probably the evidence is uh, good enough that uh, you can base actions on, on it. But other times, the, the evidence has a lot of uncertainty. And you have to be honest to yourself and to others about the the extent of uncertainty. So all of that is just within the mainframe of the scientific method. It's not some uh, uh, kind of uh, peculiar uh, or or weird or or unusual expression of how science uh, should work. So so questioning the status quo is uh, uh, pretty much the norm in science. Uh, we we don't have dogma. We don't believe in something that is immutable. Uh, we believe in, in data, in evidence, in, in screening uh, data, in identifying biases and correcting biases and trying to, to move to the next step. Well, it's interesting because we know, as I said uh, in, in the open, that we're often, and we've particularly been within the past few years, admonished to, uh, to trust the science, but it, it's difficult because it seems, you know, especially that now so many of us are paying attention that it seems that so much of the science, I mean, is there even such a thing as the science? You know what I mean? Like, th does that even make sense? And and why should we? Uh, and why should we, you know, the lay person who doesn't have time to dig through all the journals, to dig through all the research? I mean, is there any real, I guess, efficacy to, to just trusting the science now? I think it's unfortunate that uh, a var very large segment of the population has indeed lost trust in science. Uh, in, meaning that they don't uh, believe that uh, it's going to be helpful for them, uh, that it's not going to improve their lives, that it may actually harm them in, in different ways. Um, properly done and properly communicated, science is probably the best thing that can happen to humans. We're, we're homo sapiens sapiens, so we, we want knowledge, we want information that is correct and appropriate, and hopefully that information can help us to improve our lives, to live better lives, to live longer lives. Um, but as I said, uh, science is not dogma. It, it's it's not something that is fixed. We need to communicate it with the right amount of uh, of uncertainty. And it's very unfortunate that there is not enough understanding of, of that uncertainty 
uh, within the general public, uh, even less so when it comes to uh, what the scientists uh, might try to communicate to to the general public. You know, we, we maybe we're not very good communicators. It, it's not that we're not uh, well intentioned. I, I don't think that scientists are evil people, <laughs> but uh, a scientist is not trained to communicate, is not trained as someone who will be in contact with uh, with a lot of people and try to to persuade them, try to convince them, try to uh, tell them what is known and what is not known. Um, th that's not the kind of training that that we get. So so we may fail big time in in that regard. Well, it seems to me like um, you know I mentioned it again in the open, but but there's been a a deification of scientists and and of science, and it seems to me you know based on what you're saying that it. it, it in a way, it really humanizes the process and humanizes um, those who who devote themselves to it because you know there is it's like no, it's not perfect, and you know it, sometimes it seems as though it's it's just it's just as important to be wrong as it is to be right. Um, you know, as long as there's that constant, um, as you said, effort and commitment and discipline to keep you know uh, challenging and, and searching for the truth and 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 seeking out uh, data and evidence. Um, is there? I mean, do, do you think that maybe we should? Maybe we should, uh, no offense, but knock, knock scientists and uh, science down a peg or two in terms of how we uh, view it in society. I, I think that it's not an issue of knocking down science. I, I think it's an issue of, of understanding what science is and what uh, it can do and uh, how beautiful uh, it is, uh, what it can do for us. Uh, I, 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 I think it's, it's very unfortunate that many of the miscommunications have resulted into people really feeling that science is threatening them. That it is a danger, uh, and uh, uh, you know they need to fight against science. I think that this is the worst that can happen, and uh, it's also unfortunate that science has an interface, unavoidably to some extent, with many other stakeholders uh, that do not share the same scientific principles. Many of them might be uh, corporate entities, commercial entities. Uh, you know they want to make money, they want to make profit. Uh, there's so many such entities that use science or try to uh, to make uh, money out of uh, of science so so the, there's increasing suspicion and I, I think that uh, this is extremely worrisome uh, because science at its essence is organized skepticism so suspicion in the right way uh, with data and with with scrutiny of data is really good science conspiracy theories uh, or, or suspicion for the sake of suspicion, uh, or, or uh, conflicts are, are really damaging science. I mean, I think that this is where science goes wrong and where the interpretation of science uh, goes wrong. And, and many people might say, well, science is, is threatening me. It's time to try to take a, away my health, my liberty, my rights, uh, my choices, my uh, everything. That, that's a very unfortunate situation. All of that is not science. <laughs> it's it's a misrepresentation of science. Well, you know, it's it's um, interesting because I'm glad you use the term conspiracy theorist because you know if you begin to suggest, for instance, that um, scientific data and research um, could be used, uh, you know, or that that you should be skeptic uh, skeptical of of such research and data or or the findings or the consensus or whatever it is, then you're often accused of being a conspiracy theorist. I, I wrote down the, the term scientific media complex because you've covered problems in the peer review process. You've covered um, how a lots of, um, you know, so much research you know, where people are looking for funding, they're trying to get published and, you know, that generates the big headlines and then people read the headlines and say, oh, okay, well, I'll take this vitamin to, to cure myself because this paper or this uh, newspaper said this because it was based on this study, yada, yada, yada. And yet if you say like, well, I don't know if that's true or not, then people say, well, you're a, a conspiracy theorist. But then, um, but I love that you described it as organized skepticism because that seems to me to be more in line with, um, you know, with with what it's supposed to be, and I I, I share your concern um, because you know you 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 said that scientists aren't evil people. However, it seems to me, and again, I don't want to sound like a conspiracy theorist, um, you know, I, but it's I I think there is um, valid concern in that um, there there are some. I have I have a concern that there are. How can I say this? Maybe politicians or government powers, which are using um, our 
they're using our reverence for science and for scientists um, and basing policy on really bad re or flawed data and flawed research and using that in order to, I guess, almost tyrannize their population. I think that's that's a big drive of the concern. So I think that there is some merit in those people who say, you know, oh, they're they're encroaching on our liberty. But I mean, we're, I mean, how can you draw the line between um, between merited skepticism and straight out, you know, conspiracy theorizing? It seems like us, our ability to make sense is really being eroded in, in a lot of ways. I, I think it is eroded. And I think that at a minimum, there should be uh, respect for different perspectives and for different positions. And and also the, there should be some clear separation between what is evidence, what is data and what is opinions and, and what is uh, uh, kind of extrapolations of data or interpretations of data, let alone uh, policy, uh, sometimes aggressive policy, mandates, uh, uh, laws, and, and regulations. Uh, we start losing science once we go into these more advanced types of, of decision making uh, that require far more than science. They, they require a, a lot of uh, individual or collective uh, input to, to what is being decided. And, and then you can get all sorts of, of politics types of biases that uh, interfere, that have nothing to do with science. So many of, of these decisions that seem so threatening uh, and are buttressed supposedly on science, in, in fact, they're politics or, or you know, sometimes very totalitarian politics, but they're not science. Science can only go to a certain point. It can give you the evidence. What you're going to make of this is really up to people and to to their decision making processes, which hopefully should be honest, uh, humanitarian, uh, sharing uh, with empathy, democratic. But no one can guarantee that just based on science alone. Uh, science can be used and science can be heavily misused. Wow, uh, you mentioned um, I wrote down collective input, which made me think about the um, the peer review process. You know, we're, we're often told to again revere the peer review process, but as you stated, people have their own um, biases and their own um, maybe even their own agendas when they're when they're going into these things. Can you explain just a little bit to those who don't know, like, like just what the peer review process is, and but also why? Because I'm very curious about this and and what and what the issues with with that process are. Does that make sense? Is that a, a weirdly framed question? No, it's it's a very fair question. So the peer review is, is a set of practices where we try to vet some new pieces of evidence, uh, data from uh, one or more studies by other scientists who are knowledgeable in the field. And uh, they can provide input on whether they think that the data, the design, the conduct, the analysis, the conclusions are justified, whether they're worthy, whether they, they have biases, whether they have errors, whether they have problems, and hopefully uh, make suggestions on how to rectify some of these errors and biases and uh, and mishaps that, that may have uh, occurred during the conduct of, of the research. Some of the problems may be possible to fix. Some other problems may be impossible to fix because once a study is done, it may not be easy or even possible to go back and uh, correct some of the things that were done 10 years ago. So in that case, you want to have transparency. You want to have transparency that these are the errors and these are the ways that we have tried to correct them. And these are the biases and this is how we have tried to get rid of them or, or remedy them and uh, ameliorate their uh, impact, diminish their impact. And here are some other problems that are still residual problems and uh, may not allow us to have full confidence in the results. Uh, there are problems that diminish our confidence and you can have a fair assessment, sometimes subjective, sometimes a bit more objective of, of what the level of confidence might be based on what you have. This is a, a process that is, uh, uh, it's a community effort. <laughs> it's not just the team that is generating the research, it's also outside evaluators in the same community that appraise this. And increasingly, we have ways that we can ask not just a couple of other people within the community of scientists to appraise the work. We can have the entire community, in theory, appraise the work. For example, now uh, we have a lot of research that is being released very early, 
upon its com completion in, in preprints. And every scientist in theory, uh, and not just scientists, even the general public can see that and they can make comments and they can act as peer reviewers on the spot. And they may say that there's problems here, or there's major problems, or there's just fatal problems with uh, with what has been done. I think that this is this is good news. More transparency, more openness, more organized skepticism, um, more opportunities for people who are knowledgeable to see the work and to comment on that is worthwhile. However, this is a, a process that is not perfect. Uh, you can imagine that scientists are very busy people. They're overworked. Uh, they have very little time to review other people's work. And uh, in the current environment, they just do that for free. Uh, it's, it's a very rare occasion that someone will be asked to do some peer review and get money for that. They, they just uh, get an invitation. Do you want to review these papers? And uh, uh, they may spend hours, sometimes days, re reviewing it, and they do it just pro bono. Um, not too many people are willing to do this and especially spend enough time uh, doing this. And not only that, uh, they may not be qualified to do it. They may not have the full expertise to look at all the pieces of the puzzle in the research that has been done. Then much of the research that they're asked to review is not really visible based on just the manuscript that is being submitted. The, the manuscript of a scientific work is more like an advertisement. Uh, people say, I have done this work, trust me. Here's my methods, trust me, I followed this, I did this. How do we know that this is true? In a small percentage, hopefully this is very small, but we don't know exactly how small or, or larger it might be, it could be fraudulent. So it, it could be just something that is made up, <laughs> the data do not exist, the study never happened, someone fabricated the, the whole process. Uh, uncommon, but in some settings we realize that does, does happen uh, as well. Then in the vast majority of papers, of manuscripts, you see the methods, but you can really put them to work in your lab. So if even if you wanted to spend more than three hours, if you wanted to spend three months, sometimes, or occasionally even three years, you would not be able to put these methods again to work. Why? Because the details are not there. The documentation is not sufficiently uh, crisp and the data are not there. About 80% or more of scientific papers, if you want the data, you cannot get them. The, the data are hidden. <laughs> They're not shared. They need, for example, it could be data generated by a company, uh, in a clinical trial, you ask for the data and they say, no, I'm not giving them to you. I'm going to give them to you after one year, two years, three years, 99 years. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and and then that that becomes a problem. Then then you have to put trust. But trust is is not the right mix for science. You know, science is not religion. You, you, you put trust in religion, for example. Uh, in, in science, we start from being mistrustful. <laughs> you know, kindly mistrustful in a sense, um, but wanting to check, wanting to verify, wanting to find out that, that is that indeed so? Can I see the data? Maybe you, you had the best intentions. Maybe you did spend night and day over years to do this, but maybe you did it wrong. And, and I need to see it to be able to, to tell whether it is correct or, or it is not correct. You know, it, I, gosh, you said so much there. Uh, but one thing that I thought about, um, especially early on during um, during the the COVID pandemic era, um, one thing that I thought was exciting was, you know, there were all these different people who, you know, whether they were communicating via their YouTube channels or whatever, you you know, you scroll down to the comments and people are weighing in, they're giving their opinions, they're, you know, and, and, you know, you have to take everything you read from the internet with a grain of salt, obviously, but people would, would weigh in on the comments, you know, well, I'm a PhD, I'm an MD in this, and I have, uh, you know, a degree in this, um, you know, they have people who, some people have their YouTube channels, which they say with, with, where, where they're sharing, you know, this paper says, this preprint says, and what was really exciting about it is that, uh, you know, and I, maybe for the first time ever, I got to witness sort of in real time, people from all over the world who were weighing in both lay people and you know experts people who said they were experts anyway um who were pouring over all this data and what i found um continually is that the internet so to speak as a broad entity was often months and months ahead of the news cycle and other you know science i mean there's still stuff coming out today 
where you know, re just regarding the pandemic era, which is like, well, you know, we knew that in 2020 or we knew that months ago. And now you're just now saying it as if it's new information. But um, so the, the idea of transparency and making information available to as many people as possible, I, I, I love that idea. However, the problem arises um, and you and you touched on this is is the you know, how do we know that the, the you know, the expertise is genuine and and, you know, should we be gatekeeping doing more gatekeeping in terms of credentialism or and expertise? Um, I guess that the general question is, how can we, um, I'm kind of shocked by how sort of uh, scattershot the peer review process is. Is there a way to, to improve it? And, and yeah, is there a way to improve it? There's probably many ways that we can improve peer review and, and the science of peer review is, is an entire scientific field on its own. We, we have an international Congress on peer review and scientific publication. The, the latest iteration was uh, last year, and I, I, I have been one of the directors of, uh, of the Congress. There's a lot of scientists who are interested in studying and improving the way that we peer review science, the way that we evaluate science, the, the way that we correct science. So it, it's not just opinion. It's, it's not just hearsay. It's not just uh, uh, Johnny and Edie saying, I'm an expert and you do what I say. <laughs> <laughs> at, at, at the level of science, uh, this is like the level of ridiculous <laughs> statement. <laughs> uh, and and I, I think that we need to be very, very careful when we hear about expertise. Uh, it's just too much expertise floating around. And most of that is, is really very mediocre or, or less than mediocre. Right? I, I have no objection to having every person just say what they believe and what they think and, and just shout. And I, I, I would never censor uh, anyone. Uh, and uh, I, I realize that among all the statements that I make, there are some that may be correct. And there's many others that probably are false. And I, I, I feel that those who point out to me that, uh, John, what you said here or what you interpreted there is wrong, I, I feel these are my, my benefactors. But in, in, in the public arena, in, in the public space, we hear so much, there's so many people who, who write and talk and, uh, and try to interpret things that one has to be very cautious. We have a lot of uncertainty about the data. And then we have the superimposed problem of all the quote unquote experts uh, who circulate and uh, uh, <laughs> It, it's chaos. I mean, at, at that level, it's chaos. I, I don't think that these people should be silenced or censored, but it's useful for everyone to be able to understand who is talking, what is their background, what is their credentials? Um, have they done work in the field? Uh, for, for example, uh, if I start talking about astrophysics, uh, being a highly excited scientist does not save me from just uh, conveying nonsense nonstop, isn't it? Um, and I may still be conveying nonsense even when I talk about a topic that is very close to heart in the work that I do, if, if my research is wrong. Science is often wrong, uh, but it has the great advantage that it tries to identify where it's wrong. It tries to self-correct itself. That's the, the one difference that, that makes it really such a thriving system, the, the ability to recognize that we are wrong here we need to improve and and we do improve and look at that now it, it works better you know I, i'm constantly jotting down i feel like i'm in a class right now um you know I, and i know that we can uh, or you can talk about and it's weird you know and I'm, I'm laughing because on one hand there is a certain very prominent astrophysicist who keeps commenting on things that are outside his realm of expertise and lately he's been uh, beclowning himself so we, we but we won't we won't uh, you know, for, for, for the sake of uh, protection, we won't name who this person is, but I'm sure many of my viewers will know who that is. Um, but I want to shift gears a little bit because, you know, you, you've talked so much about science and I've, I've just been writing furiously um, because there's so much that you said that have drawn parallels to to my particular focus on this on this show, which is one which is what I why I wanted to have you on. And, um, you know, there's so much. But I guess, you know, one thing I'll start off with is is. One thing that I noticed um, that, that really occurred to me, particularly over the past few years, is that, you know, I think we, we view ourselves, at least here in the in the West, uh, as this, as, especially in America, as this sort of um, 
or there's a prominent sector of the population, let's say, that you say, well, we have this great technology and we have this great, you know, science. We're a very rational, you know, scientific um, society. We, we value science and we trust the science, all these other things. But at the same time, it, it feels to me that, or became evident to me that simply being smart and knowing things or having sort of, you know, knowledge or having facts sort of is not enough. And, you know, certainly not enough for a well-rounded life, but certainly not enough to really be able to embrace the fullness of being alive and experiencing being alive. And that's why you have these decisions where it's like, we're, we're going to lock people down and stay and tell them to stay in their houses and not see their friends and family and cover up their faces. And so I, I guess the question I have for you, which is why I, I wanted to have you on is, you know, sometimes we link uh, art and science, or we talk about, you know, the, the, the College of Art and Sciences or whatever, but it seems like science is so much more elevated in our society than art is. And I think the consequence of that is that um, maybe there's a certain, um, maybe soul or spiritual realm that, that we are, that we are missing. And um, I guess my, my, my question for you is, do you think, can our, Gosh, I'm at a loss for words. It's, it, do, do we do we value science too much, and and do we do you think that we deprioritize art uh, too much as a result, or almost as a result? Is, is that a, a weird question? Uh, you know, no, I'm it's to it it's out. a very fair question. I I think that both good science and and good art are are tremendously undervalued, uh, unfortunately. Hmm. Uh, I think. Yes, there's there's more science-like and, and scientism-like uh, material that is floating around, uh, but much of that is not really in the best tradition of science. I think it's it's science being uh, transmuted into other forms that serve very different, sometimes very base interests. Uh, really good science, you know, science education, unfortunately, is is. <laughs> is very limited, both in the US and, and in other countries. Um, e exposure to, to the fundamental norms of science, like organized skepticism, uh, disinterestedness, um, communalism, uh, universalism, P people are not exposed to that. They, they just see splashes of, of, uh, of supposedly big scientific achievements and, and then science being used as ammunition by politicians and by uh, commercial uh, gain, people who uh, just try to make uh, more power and more money out of it. So, so this is not science. <laughs> I, th I think I think it's uh, uh, it's not good science that that people are exposed to, and they're exposed to a lot of that. Now, art, goodness, it's entirely undervalued. I think that it's just getting worse and worse, and I, I think that. Uh, in the last several years, I've seen that uh, decay accelerate very fast. I, I think that at all levels, art education is, is minimal, almost gone. Uh, exposure to art, especially good art, serious art, art that, that really has merit uh, is diminishing. There's some uh, art that might be sometimes very popular, but uh, I, I think that that most of the time it's not good art that uh, that would be visible or available to be consumed <laughs> in, uh, in in massive doses. So I, I think that this is a major problem uh, because this means that our our critical thinking uh, is uh, really getting a blow from lack of exposure to good science and, and good science education and our creative, and expressive brain is also getting devastated by not being exposed to to good art. Uh, I, I'm not sure which one is worse. <laughs> I, I, I think that that both are horrible, and and they create probably uh, a situation where where many people lose some of the the finest fascination that human life can offer, and that can also take them to to a level of of feeling part of a of a vibrant community that um that 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 really makes life worth living it it's it, it's a shame it's it's really a shame and I, 
I, I'm, I'm not sure whether I feel more sorry for the, the demise of science or for the demise of art. Both, both are, are really hit hard at the moment. Yeah, you know, as as you were speaking, I was getting very emotional because, uh, you know, I'm thinking about, I mean, a big, a big part of, I guess, if you want to call it my message now is how important um, the arts are to the, the, the spirit or the soul of society. And, you know, there's a big story happening right now, just the other day, um, that there was a symphony orchestra in, in Seattle, where the local newspaper reported that, that, you know, it was a very impressive opening, but you know, almost nobody was there. And they're wondering, you know, why no one's coming to shows anymore in the theater right now, our regional circuit. Um, there are many theaters around the country, which are either they're shuttering their doors completely, or they're they're pausing their seasons, or they're, you know, they're, they're truncating their seasons. And, you know, for me, I was one of the only people who was saying, guys, we can't shut down theaters, we can't shut down shows for this protracted, uh, you know, extended period of time. And um, now they're bearing the results of what's going on. And, you know, because I was my concern was that, you know, we were actually eroding theater going culture. And I think, you know, for you, for someone like you, you know, who, who is Greek, I mean, I'm, I'm reading a lot of this old, you know, Greek literature right now. And for one, it's stunning how much um, how much they knew back then. Um, but also, you know, the, the the sort of reverence with which we talk about science now, they also spoke about it, not just of like science and philosophy, but also of, with art and drama and theater and all these other things. And it seems like that's been lost. I mean, I, I got a quote from you, which you said a, a pervasive theme of ancient Greek literature is that you need to pursue the truth, no matter what the truth might be. And, it, you know, the, the, it's, it's been so um, devastating to me to not only see the arts be undervalued, not just by the general public, but now given the events of the past few years by artists themselves, by professionals themselves, by industry leaders themselves. And, you know, it's these, this bad science is used, has been used to, you know, to enact these coercive um, mandates. And it's not just that people like me have been, you know, barred or blacklisted from their former professions. It's that now you have generations of people now who have been kept out of museums, they've been kept out of symphony halls, they've been kept out of dance halls, they've been kept out of, um, you know, uh, these these live performance venues, sports is doing fine, right. Um, but, you know, and I love sports that that's, that's great, that that's a whole different kind of human art artistry. But the but as you say, the, like the these fine arts and the, these, these works that, uh, you know, these great products of, of human ingenuity and creativity, um, you know, the, the fact that that we have artists, so-called artists, who undervalue themselves and their role in society so much that they'd be able to just say, "No, you know, we're not, we're not essential. We're not, we're not essential." Um, it's stunning to me. So it's just very, you know, I'm kind of rambling on, but it's just deeply moving to hear, um, you know, someone, a scientist of your stature, um, comment so passionately mm -hmm. about the importance of art. It is, it is very disheartening. I, I, I fully agree. And uh, in, in my experience, I, I know. Uh, many artists who have struggled during these years. Uh, it has been a, a complete shock to to their career and to, to what they can do or what what they cannot do. I mean, many arts were probably in life support even before the pandemic. Uh, you know, classical music, opera, uh, areas that uh, I'm interested in, uh, really depended on life support of, of sponsors who would be able to maintain them. And after shutting them down for such a long time, the audiences have not come back, the productions are not starting again, uh, or they're starting at a much lower uh, rate. And uh, uh, people who were devoted and were working on these fields, uh, sometimes with very tenuous uh, standards of, of salary or, or pay, uh, you know, they suddenly found themselves that, goodness, I need to find something else to do. I, I, this is not possible. The world is not interested in me any longer. <laughs> it's not interested in art, in, in serious art, in, in good art at least, in, because there's still some blockbuster types of art that probably will attract big audiences, but I don't think that this will save the day. My, my experience has been devastating in that regard uh, for, for many people who, who I know. Um, you know for, if you take opera, for example, and classical music, uh, in, in the Bay Area, we have the... the um, uh, a listing of, of events uh, that uh, that you can uh, you can see how many events are are going on and and uh, <laughs> before the pandemic there there used to be dozens of events every night uh, of 
classical music and recitals and concerts and and opera and now it's none or one or or two very often in most days and uh, uh, if you look at the at the Stanford events calendar there's lectures uh, about medical topics uh, which actually did not tend to be as far as I remember listed under the events you know I was thinking of events mostly as art and scholarship and and uh, kind of broader uh, culture uh, type of events. And now we have some medical events, but uh, if you look for, for music and other arts, there are far, far fewer. Sometimes there's nothing on campus in, in many evenings. Uh, during the pandemic, I, I was uh, launching an opera where I wrote the libretto with composer Harris Rondos uh, for the, the Greek National Opera. The, the opera could not be staged with a live audience. So uh, it was it got its its world premiere uh, by being virtually presented. <laughs> so so it was videotaped without a live audience. How can you have opera without a live audience? Uh, uh, opera is like the continuation of ancient Greek tragedy. At least this is the way that I see it. It's it's dependent on the interaction with the audience. I don't think that that virtual Zoom. Besides the fact of transmuting me to a ghost right now, <laughs> can can really do the trick and uh, achieve that connection that you need with uh, with a live audience. I've had another opera, the necklace that I wrote the libretto that uh, has been very generously uh, generously supported by the deans of the medical school and of the school of humanities and sciences uh, at Stanford, and we haven't been able to to launch it for. Uh, Three years now. Hopefully, we will launch it uh, in a couple of months uh, in uh, in November. But um, th these are just examples, and I I'm sure that this far worse that one can describe about the disruption that has occurred in uh, in arts and in trying to link arts to the community. Yeah, it, it's um, you know you mentioned the Bay Area, which I you know I'm, I I love the Bay Area, and a, a lot of the headlines right now are about um, you know right the 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 declining quality of life and problems with public safety, and it just makes me think you know what if there were more music events? What if there were more opera? You know if because you know the, the, you read about how we're we're sort of an ailing nation, an ailing society, and you know rates of depression and anxiety and self harm have you know have skyrocketed, particularly within the, within the past few years. And it's like well, what if people could you know go to the opera house or what or you know maybe just to the museum and and soothe their souls by taking in just the the greatest of um, of human achievement um you know I, I i do have a question for you in your capacity as an artist is um you know you you've because you know and i i was trying not to uh, make it about myself but there was so much you said you said about empathy and you know curiosity as far as as far as you know questioning with with science the scientific process and effort and commitment um and I, it just makes me think about the process of when I'm when I'm investigating a role and creating a character because I'm reading the script over and over again and I'm constantly asking questions. I all I always live in the in the in the unknown and not knowing things. And the rehearsal process is again you're failing over and over and over again. It's actually you learn more by failing than you do by you know nailing a certain moment. And um, you know, and I was told by uh, the late Zelda Fitchhandler, who was a, a wonderful teacher, who I told you before we got on, she would always post um, at the graduate acting program uh, at, at Tisch. You know, she'd always post these scientific, um, um, you know, research and 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 uh, and you know, articles or whatever. Who knows if they were actually good or not? But <laughs> based on what we've talked about, but um, you know, she was always trying to get us to think, you know, outside of the box and and to as actors and to you know really engage with the world um not just through our senses but in other way and other ways as well so i mean i say all of that to to say to ask you about the link between the maybe the scientific brain and the um and the creative brain and i guess specifically for you in your process of creating these operas which i hope you know to to to, to be in or, or excuse me to see I, that's a freudian slip <laughs> i said to be in um you know have you found uh, any link between or similarities I guess a better question would be what are what what are what are the similarities and differences between the creative process and the scientific process that you found? I think that the human brain is uh, wonderfully uh, integrated and uh, it's uh, impossible really to separate uh, the scientific process from from the artistic process. there's there's lots of commonalities. Of course, there's lots of of differences or 
or idiosyncratic uh, aspects that that make one artist different from another artist uh, and one scientist different from another scientist. Uh, uh, so I, I I tend to see humans as uh, a, a single piece <laughs> rather than than try to to divide. Uh, well, this is science, you know, in, in its little box, uh, and this is art in its little box. We we need everything. We 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 need to support our growth as personalities, as people, as as uh, as citizens, uh, with all tools that are intellect and and our heart and our emotions and uh, our our thinking uh, can garner. And uh, I I think it's unfortunate to to have dichotomies and to to say that one is fighting uh, against the other. The creative process is a mystery. If, if you know how to uh, enhance it uh, and uh, you have well-tested data on that, please let me know because I will <laughs> use it immediately. Well, I'm uh, an expert. I guess I'm an expert. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's, it's really a mystery, both in terms of science and in terms of, of art. Uh, uh, where do great ideas come from? I think what we do know is that they do come mostly to people who have worked very hard, uh, who have a lot of interest, who keep thinking about whatever it is, a day and night. Um, and you know, you don't know whether that idea will hit you at three o'clock after midnight uh, or 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 at noon time. Um, but it's unlikely that it will hit you unless you have really invested on thinking about it, really be interested in it, investing in it, working on it, improving your skills. Improving your skills could happen both in science and in, in art. Uh, you know, you need to master techniques. You need to master how do I do this experiment? How do I run that statistical analysis? That does not happen overnight. It's very hard work. Same thing in art. It's very hard work. You know, people who think that, oh, you know, you will just become the best actor or the best uh, uh, composer or, or the best poet just by throwing uh, dice. <laughs> that's that's not going to happen. Uh, it, 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 you know very well that it takes a lot of hard work, a lot of ex uh, practice, a, a lot of exposure, and also a lot of exposure to good practices. I mean, this is where it comes to both science and art. Uh, being able to feed from the best science, which means that you're well trained to understand where to find that best science. Same thing in art, being able to feed from the best people who are practicing art in the field and learn from them, still keeping your, your originality and individuality, but, but really starting from, from what is already known and what is already conquered and what is already achieved. Uh, so I, I think this there's more commonalities than, than differences. And I think that there's also a common denominator that both are human enterprises. And eventually they try to, to reach to a greater depth of our humanity. Uh, both science and art are human enterprises. They could be biased in that regard. And we can use bias both in science and in art in good ways and in bad ways. You know, it's it's interesting because um, I jotted down the, the great uh, Russian director and um, and uh, teacher uh, Konstantin Stanislavsky, who's often widely credited with uh, sort of bringing uh, the method style of acting, although I think it's a bit of a mis it's misunderstood, um, over to the West. And um, you know, he he would often say that the rehearsal process is a conscious process to achieve unconscious results. And similarly, I'm going to um, you know allude to Zelda Fitzchandler once again. Because um, she talked about how information is inspiration, and you know, and people don't understand, especially with regards to acting. You know, if if I get a role, hey, I'm, I'm examining that script, you know, like a scientist. I'm going through line by line, asking, what does this mean to me? How do I feel about that? And I'm engaging my my brain in terms of analyzing, like what the story structure is, scene by scene. What are the events? What are the relationships between the characters? What is the what is the author telling me about this character? What do the other characters say about my character? What do I say about myself? But you know, how can I use that information? I'm doing research around the the script. You know, maybe the writer's life and and what their uh, what their biases and interests and their and their demons were. What about the period that it takes place in? You know, where did a, does, does a person live? You know, what was the climate like? How would that affect how they how they behave, how they move, and and you know how they dress, how they carry themselves? And what you're doing is, I mean, the, the greatest, right? The greatest actors 
you know, you know, how do they speak? What's their cadence like? You know, they, they're, you know, what's their inner emotional like? Like they're, they're doing all this work and trying to synthesize all this information in order to create moments like little moments. And, and I said, if people really knew the kind of work that goes into creating a great performance, we have way, way fewer actors and the world would be better off for it. Um, <laughs> I also love what you said about the integration. I mean, there's something there about the integration of between the imagination and the intellect. And I think it, 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 it is great. Uh, it is, you know, better for us not to uh, look at the two things as separate beings, but as part of one integrated whole, definitely. And I think it seems like from what I'm from what I'm gaining from this conversation, the great scientists and the great artists are actually um, in agreement on that on that aspect. I, I think that it would be very useful to have more people from the sciences talk to people from from the arts. Uh, there are some individuals who try to work in in both areas, but of course, uh, Leonardo da Vinci's are not uh, easy to find. You know, people who would excel uh, both on science and and in art. Uh, but the incentive structure for our society is really to keep these communities separate, and uh, I think I think that this is also unfortunate. I, I think that we have a lot to learn by talking with people who do creative work in other areas. Uh, we need to open our minds that. I, I never feel that I can seize learning from colleagues and the further away that they are from my own field, the, the greatest the opportunities are. I, sometimes I feel like I, I meet people who are apparently working on something that is very far from what I do. And I realize, goodness, I, I was struggling to do something similar. I was getting nowhere. And here they have a solution. They have done it very well. I need to learn from them. We, we need to learn. I, I think the learning process is key both for for sciences and, and arts. Uh, I think good scientists keep learning. They, they realize that they know very little and they need to learn more. And I think good artists also are always learning at every moment. They, 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 they're not happy with what they have. They want to take it a step further. And, and un, unless they take it a step further, they're, they're not gonna put themselves to rest. Yeah, I totally agreed. You know, I, I, I um... I can't think of a better way to to end than on you know what well, we we need to learn and I know I I set my I myself am very humbled, um, you know we always talk often talk about the the ego of the artist but I know for myself the more that I read and again this goes back into like reading these old Greek um, you know old Greek literature treatises all this other stuff you know the more I read the more I realize man I don't know anything, and um, it's not it's humbling but it's also exciting because that means that there's always something else to learn. Um, John, it certainly has been a pleasure. I know that we're up on time. Uh, yeah, I have to say that uh, you know I've 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 uh, learned so lot. So I've learned. I can't even talk. I've learned so much um, from just listening to you. And uh, you know, you really are. People like you are why I do this show. I really feel like um, the arts, as you feel, are very undervalued. And I feel uh, and and I, I wish that we had more. I wish that the arts had more ambassadors, frankly, like you, who could so passionately and so articulately um, and eloquently communicate why um, they they are important and also why artists uh, artists should artists and scientists should um, should broaden their horizons and how we we as individuals and how we as a society could be better for it. So I just uh, so uh, again, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Yonides. Uh, it's just been thank such uh, a pleasure. Thank, thank you, Clifton. And let's hope for more science and more art and particularly good science and, and good art. Thank you.